what you need to know is it is 1879. We're in Newton, Kansas. A brand new house, very handsome, Italianate style house has been built on a 160 acre plot in, uh, in Newton. And uh, almost nothing else is visible from this house. The name of the house is Ambleside. It is occupied by the people who built it, Emmeline and Henry Luke Hart, who are, in fact, Warren's great-grandparents in real life. A family portrait from back east has been sent out because Emmeline wrote back to relatives back east and said, send art, there's nothing here. And so the portrait has arrived and has been hung on the dining room wall. This is from chapter one. Ambleside is the name of the chapter. And uh, 1879. Finally, one evening, about six months after she had been hung up on the dining room wall, we became distinctly aware of a voice that could only be described as exasperated, practically a bellow. Oh, for pity's sake, you ignorant people. It's not spiel, it's peel. Mrs. S. Peel. And we are in no way related. You speak? We inquired, quite surprised. Who said that? We did. We are Ambleside. What do you mean, we are Ambleside? We are Ambleside. We are the house. And you speak? She asked in an astonished tone. Only to other works of art made with affection and skill, are you a work of art? Oh, my heavens, yes. Yes, I am a portrait. And I thought I would be all alone on this wall forever with these people who are not my people. Can you... Sorry, a pause ensued. Can you see me? She asked us. We see only that which is without. We cannot see within. Can you see within? Yes, I see quite clearly almost the whole dining room. Can you hear them at the table? Oh, how they do talk. We hear, but we cannot understand the language of men. Their sounds are too temporal. We only hear that which is little affected by time, that which is timeless. Then you do not hear what these impossible people call me. <laughs> no. What are you called? Mrs. Simon Peel is my correct appellation. But they think I am Mrs. Spiel. Some old biddy with a shaky hand wrote my name in a letter accompanying me, and it was so illegible that Mrs. S. Peel, that is myself, was read as Mrs. Spiel. That must be most vexing. Yes, it most certainly is galling and will never be corrected. We waited for a moment. Then we asked, pray tell us, do you hear them everywhere in Ambleside? No, she said. Just here in the dining room, and sometimes the kitchen, unless voices are raised elsewhere, which is blessedly rare. They are, by and large, a well-tempered pair. I will give them that. Tell me, do they speak well of us? Oh, indeed. They praise this house to all who will listen, and over and over they tell the story of your very beginnings as if you were one of the wonders of the world. Wonders of the world? Well, we should very much like to know of such things. Well, she said, there's no time like the present. And she let out a high-pitched blast. Ah, I died in 1841, but there's no time like the present. Ha! We were silent. Presently, the sound subsided. Yes. yes, 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 I can tell you the story. I have certainly heard it often enough. Please, madam, do. Thus, Mrs. Peel began to unfold the mysteries of our origin. So now we have met Ambleside and we've met Mrs. Peel. Um, how do two people write? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. So how do two people together write one book 
of fiction. Uh, I think it's, it's been done by others, certainly, but I will tell you how we did it. Um, first, I want to say that the book is really Warren's brainchild. It came to him full blown, and he will tell you a little bit about that. But he would sit with his legal pad or with his notebook and write each chapter longhand, and then he would take it to his computer, and he would type it into his computer and do a gentle edit, and then he would push a button and he would send it to my computer, which was upstairs, and I would uh, go at it to make it really what we say, the, the, the clearest thing I can say is that he wrote the book in black and white and I blew in the color. So I would take whatever uh, he had come up with, the characters and the situations and the, the, the narrative arc, and I would just have fun with it. I got to jazz it up, and uh, that was tremendous fun. Um, One of the gifts of the computer is that editing, the editing function um, is, um, sets all the changes over into the margin. And the changes, yeah. Okay, so the changes we set over into the margin and so that you don't, I was never faced with this uh, manuscript full of red lines that Susan had done. Instead, I was faced with basically a new, uh, a new body of manuscript that I could just read through and I didn't have to look too closely to see which of my darlings had been killed and put over into the side. Uh, and that was, a, it was a, that's kind of a, a blessing of the, the editing, the word process. Yeah. Uh, another advantage of COVID uh, was that our adult children, we have two sons and they each have two wives or one, one wife and one almost wife. Um, they came to stay with us during COVID to get out of the city and um, so we had listeners. It's, it's a great blessing to have first readers. Everybody who writes needs a first reader, but because this book is all dialogue, Ambleside, the narrator, is either talking to you, the reader, or he and Mrs. Peel are talking to each other. Um, we had first listeners, which was tremendous. So at the end of every day and after dinner and after we did all the dishes because the daughter-in-laws like to do all the dishes right after dinner, we did that. And then we sat down and we would read a chapter. And we got feedback from them and that was absolutely invaluable. Uh, I think maybe we'll just read, a, that's just what we'll do now. We'll read aloud on, on one more chapter. Uh, this one is called Italians in Kansas, chapter four. Yes. We have a, we have a book here. Could you give us a page number? Ah, oh, oh, very good. 27. Page 27. 27. And we won't read the whole chapter. We'll, we're going to read bits of chapters. This is, takes place uh, uh, just a couple of weeks later from the chapter we just read you. What is Italianate style, Mrs. Peel? We asked one night as the spring rain pattered ceaselessly on our roof. Does it not refer to a foreign land? Yes, it does. It refers to a far away, very old country on the continent of Europe called Italy. We have been thinking that common sense would indicate that we were built in the Kansas style, would it not? Kansas style, she erupted, and rather unpleasantly, too. Ah! We were rather taken by surprise. From what I have heard from the people around this dining room table, I would say that any house unfortunate enough to be made in the Kansas style would be made entirely of mud and sod. Good heavens, the poor brutes. With a few cottonwood logs to hold up the door and one window, if that. Sod and mud. No, you can't mean it. I most certainly do. You, Ambleside, instead of all your fine timber and strong, beautifully crafted joinery, 
could have been made out of... Mud? Sod? <laughs> and she enjoyed herself rather at our expense for a good while. At, la at least it interrupted the tedious rain. We pressed on through her burbling. Are we neither in any American style then, Mrs. Peel? Ah, an astute question, Master House. I would say there is an American style, Ambleside, but apparently you are no example. Back in my time and in the time of my parents, we built houses that were simple, practical, and sound. Oh, yes, occasionally you found some poor building where the proud new owners had stuck Greek pilasters on either side of their front door or some such fluty nonsense to announce both their wealth and their lack of taste. But that really was the limit in my time of architectural vanity. Vanity? We did not, we did not know that word. From the Latin vanus, empty, void, idle, or fruitless. She paused. We might have appreciated a snippet of reassurance, but she continued her lesson, and we hastened to keep up. Now I hear much talk of fashion, and the fashion seems to be to imitate Europe of all things. Please instruct us, then, what Italianate means. We pressed on. According to Mrs. Hart, it is a style very much in fashion. She loves to talk about your large lintels, your fanciful corbels, your many different paint colors, your broad or hanging cornice. So you have cornices, Ambleside. Sounds rather like an affliction. Do you suffer from cornices, sir? Ha! Now you are making merry with us, we protested over the resounding guffaws and cackles, we would say that we are rich in elaborate woodwork and pleasant carving. Are you? We are much more so than several houses recently built within our long view towards the village. And while their roofs are steeply pitched, we know that our roof is nearly flat. Flat? You are flat-roofed? I'm not sure I've ever seen such a thing except... Except, perhaps, on a chicken coop. Oh, oh terrible, Hermione, terrible. Oh, oh. Raising our voice, we soldiered on. Our corbels and cornice are painted in four different colors. Four? Like a harlequin? A muffled rumble. Surely, we insisted, such embellishments prevail. In the fashionable country of Italy, they must, if we are Italianate. We had managed to score our point. She quieted. You are brand new, and the height of fashion, Ambleside, that is clear, and it is I who am old and out of date. The heart's guests speak of so many different house styles now. I hear them talk of queen somebody, gothic something or other, someone's revival, second empire, never first or third, and even, God help us, Egyptian but they seem to disdain anything that sounds the least bit familiar to me. It is quite dislocating. Dislocare. Latin? To put out of place. And after the briefest pause. That is most certainly an apt description of me. Keep going. Here we go. So uh, we will be reading uh, parts of two more chapters shortly. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to, to raise your hand, and we will answer them as we're going along. Good. Uh, I can repeat the question. What it was... I was wondering how the house became a plural instead of ah, a singular The question was, why does the house speak in the first person plural? So I, when I first sat down to read this book, I'm an architect by trade. I'm also an architectural historian. When I first sat down to read, and I've often, for me, I, I've, I'm very curious about whether a house has a soul. It's, in fact, I think sometimes much of the book is about does 
heart have a soul? Um, we were just in Gretchen and Michael's house this afternoon, and I believe that that house has a, a very strong soul. There are many houses that we look at, and there are many buildings we look at that we feel are, we would call them soulless. So this, the book is very much a meditation on that. And so the moment I sat down to write this book, I knew that the house referred to itself in the first person, in the we. Just, that's part of it. It's a, it's a great question, and it's coming from an engineer. Excellent, okay. excellent. <laughs> so there might be some connection there. <laughs> Do you want to take any other questions right now? Sure. Are any there questions, questions right now? Otherwise, yeah. Ted. This, this may be premature, but uh, I, rem no. <laughs> I remember from the book that you visited uh, Newton in 2007. What caused that visit, and was that your first time to see the house? It was, in fact, the, first, the very first time we saw it. The house. This is a historical novel. Much of it, as much as we could hew to the facts, we did. Um, the, my mother used to speak of this house. Um, and these were 2007. She had mentioned something about it, and she gave me a postcard. I have, and it's a postcard of Sand Creek. And I said, well, what's the significance of this postcard? Well, she said Sand Creek used to run through my mother's house property, my mother-in-law's house property. And uh, I got more and more curious. Susan is from Kansas City. We came to Kansas City two or three times a year uh, to visit family. And so one time I said, well, let's, it's time to go see this house. My mother who grew up in Santa Barbara, had never seen this house. She'd heard about it. She'd heard her mother-in-law talk about it all the time. Her mother and her mother-in-law. Mother right. Her mother-in-law. Sorry, I get them confused. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, we, the, and so it was a perfect opportunity, and we drove over and got to, to, to see the house. But the fun way we did it was that we uh, wrote to the Harvey County Historical Society. I had no idea anything except the name of the house. That's all I had. So I wrote them a letter. A woman at the Harvey County Historical Society named Jane Jones wrote back, and she said, yes, there is a house called Ambleside here in Newton. It happens to be at number one Ambleside Lane. Um, and here is, that's who you should, you can contact the people who live there. So I wrote them a letter, and it was a very, the letter said, my wife and I are, I'm an architect, architectural historian, this house was built by my great grandfather, we're going to be in Newton in June of, 2000, June of this year, and if you see people out on your sidewalk taking photographs of your house, you can know that's, that's who's doing it. We got back, you tell this part. Immediately, as fast as the United States Post can turn something around, we got a letter back from the owners of the house and the envelope arrived addressed to Warren. Turning over the envelope, the return address was printed on the envelope, but beautiful engraving of Ambleside with, uh, with the address. So we immediately knew that these people really loved this house and had a relationship with this house. And they said, come, we want to meet you, lunch on the porch, can't wait to meet you. By, and by the way, we know a lot about this house and we know a lot about your family. It turned out they knew 10 times more about his family than he did. <laughs> they, had, and had, they had done a lot of genealogical research and, and they had found out marvelous things and they had wonderful photographs. In fact, this photograph comes from their collection and this is a photograph of the house um, taken in about 1910. Right. So that was, that was a wonderful 
opportunity and um, they still live there. They have been preserving the house and restoring it since 1994 and it needed a lot by, by 1994 and those of you, if you, well, that, that's part of the book. It does fall into deep disrepair and needs restoration. So the, the, names are, the names of the current owners in the book are fictionalized, are fictionalized right. just for their privacy. And everything about them, whatever little funninesses there are, is all fiction. Uh, yeah. And the, the family, my family, so my family did live there in the house from uh, up until 1947. Um, my uh, great-grandmother uh, was alive until 1947. She raised uh, the family there in the house. Um, their middle daughter was my grandmother. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have a question? Other questions? Other questions? There's some strange woman on the front here. <laughs> I was just realizing that if, for those who haven't read the book yet, um, they don't know, um, they know the personality of Mrs. Peel, but they don't know about her background. Mm. Are you, were you going to read some of that? And if not, do you want to say a little bit about her? I think background? we could say a little about her, yeah. We, yes. Um, That's because I don't think we're going to read anything that touches on, uh, well, I tell you what, let's read the next chapter, The Sabine Woman, and then we'll talk a little about Mrs. Peel. How's that sound? That sounds fine. That yeah. Fine. And what's page, the page? Page for 55. Page 55. So this is chapter 10. It's called The Sabine Woman. It takes place in March of 1884, that is to say five years after the two chapters we just read. Mrs. Peel called to us one day in late winter, Ambleside. Ambleside. The sun is, sorry, that's the your line. The sun is peering <laughs> through my dining room window today and falling no farther than the feet of the sideboard. Soon it will be rising higher in the sky and will no longer shine in directly. I shall miss it. But it means that winter is ending and our growing family will welcome the spring. We were glad to hear from our portrait, for we had been wondering about something and welcomed an opportunity to seek her wisdom. We responded, we are reminded of the day you found yourself in our parlor and then our upstairs bedroom. You told us how the sun blazed through our tall windows so remarkably. That was the day the wallpaper was hung, Mrs. Peel. Remember you that day? Do you mean, she replied hotly, do I remember the day I was thrown to the ground and carried off by a big hairy brute like one of the Sabine women? I am not likely to forget it. We decided to delay our curiosity about a Sabine woman and proceed to our current concern. We believe that it was on that day that you first mentioned a Hebrew, Mr. Boaz. It did not seem the moment to inquire. I was rather in extremis, yes. Since that time, we had been concerned in the reference you made during that extremis that we did not know what a Hebrew is. Is that a word for a purveyor of wallpaper? <laughs> we sensed a slight pause before she answered. Amble sighed. You are by far the most tenacious student I ever had. You listen. We have always listened, Mrs. Peel. But before we knew you, we could not understand. Now we want to understand everything. Everything? Well, I can only tell you the things I know myself, which in the great scheme of things is very little. But I can address your question today what a Hebrew is. Oof, there are many answers to that question, Ambleside, many answers. In fact, it is a question that goes to the roots of Western civilization. We were surprised. Is wallpaper so important to the history of man? <laughs> this took us quite by surprise. You are a most amusing domicile. No, no, no. Now see here, let us get one, thri one thing straight. Mr. Boaz is a Hebrew, true. Mr. Boaz sells wallpaper, true. 
but it does not therefore follow that all Hebrews sell wallpaper. Do you understand? That is called false logic. But what then does it mean? The word itself has a number of meanings. It can refer to a language, a race of people, or a member of an ancient religion. Religion? Oh, dear. From the Latin, religare, to bind, to place an obligation on, that is, to hold fast to a god or gods or a set of beliefs. We were compelled to interrupt. Uh, do you mean to tell us, Mrs. Peel, that religion is similar to language among men? That there is more than one? And people can be one religion and not understand people who are another? You know, she said after a moment, you have a way of parsing things, Ambleside, that cuts quite neatly to the chase. We did not understand these words, but her tone was reassuring and we did not interrupt. I, for example, am what is called a Christian. I hold fast to the teachings of a religious leader called Jesus, who was himself a Hebrew, as in a member of that very old religion. Oh, so that means you attended school conducted by this Mr. Jesus? There was a long sigh. This Mr. Jesus lived about 2,000 years ago. Oh, oh, when Latin and Greek were spoken and Ovid wrote stories. We were anxious for her to know that we were not as dumb as a door. Yes, in fact, at that very time and in that very part of the world. Now then, she continued, to begin again, many people followed the new teachings of Jesus, but some held fast to their old beliefs. We call those people Hebrews or sometimes Jews, though in my day that word was usually used only when preceded by rude adjectives. It is a fact that many Christians loathe the Hebrews, though we Sutters were not among them. Mr. Boaz, for your information, owns a store in Newton that sells a great abundance of useful things, from fabrics and sewing notions, sheets and blankets and rugs, to soap, knickers, corsets, stockings and garters and shoes, hairbrushes and combs, kitchen pots and pans, to furniture, chandeliers. And wallpaper? And, yes, wallpaper. Mr. Hart is very fond of Mr. Boaz. Mrs. Hart is not. Why is that, we asked. Mrs. Peel paused, and after a moment we asked, do you mean she dislikes this merchant because of his religion? Let's see. So, so a little bit about Mrs. Peel, Susan little. Jane. Why don't you tell us a little about okay. Mrs. Peel? Um, I will tell you about Mrs. Peel. Um, from the standpoint of everyone says when you've written a book or a story or a play or an opera or anything, where's the conflict? The conflict in this book comes from Mrs. Peel's background. Mrs. Peel was born in 1802 in Hartford, Connecticut, and she married a timber framer, a carpenter whose business was framing houses, building houses. Um, she considered herself a not particularly attractive woman, and when she found that this young man who had inherited his father's um, carpentry business uh, was coming around a lot and he liked to talk to her a lot and she was very good with numbers and things like that and he was not particularly good with numbers and accounts and clients and things like that. Um, he uh, asked her to marry him and she was pretty flabbergasted and she did. It was a beautiful marriage. They adored each other. They were very, very young. And she learned the timber framing trade. She was his um, eyes and ears on the job. She learned all about how it worked. She was not a timber framer herself, No, of but she learned joinery by watching and by knowing how it was done. And 
by the love that her husband had for his work. So when, uh, when Mrs. Peel comes to live in Ambleside, Ambleside, she assumes, because she has died in 1841, she comes to live in this house, and she just assumes that this house is built like every other house she ever was in, that was a wood house. And she finds out, very accidentally, that he's not built that way at all. He is built by the new, what was called balloon frame construction. To her, a two by four was a toothpick compared to an eight by eight or 10 by 10 timber frame member. And she has an absolute fit. <laughs> when she finds when out. When she that finds this out. This house is made of scantling and little lightweight timbers. And right. she feels very nervous hanging on her nail in the dining room. She accuses him of being a perfidious liar. And just like all men, he, he, he's, it's very, it, she just lets him have it. She just lets him have it. And he doesn't even know what he's done. She won't even tell him what it is that he's done that's upset her so. And uh, has it out, and a month goes by before she will even speak to him again. And he finally, finally draws it out from her that she has felt that she's been lied to, and she is afraid for her very life, as, as it is as a portrait, that any day now, this, uh, this house that she's in might just blow away, because that's how people talked about balloon framing in those days. She hears it talked about around the, ki around the dining room table, and um, she knows that it's called balloon framing, and she knows it's called that because it's as light as a balloon, and it might just take off like a hot air balloon, and now she's terrified and mad at him. And once she did it, then all of the Latin that she was teaching us, oh, where that, does that come from? Okay. Um, she is a very, very educated person. Uh, and after she, she takes a year to recover from uh, her husband dies of yellow fever, and she goes home to live with her parents. And her father, who was a sculptor, now Hartford, Connecticut was a great center of um, learning and art and thought, progressive thought, in those times. And um, her father comes into her room when, uh, while she's living there over the year, while she's just grieving. They just leave her alone and let her do her grieving. And he comes in and he brings Ovid and he reads to her from Ovid in Latin and um, he, he becomes, Ovid becomes her, her comfort, as well as her, her father is her comfort. And uh, we find out that when this painting was painted of her, much later, after this uh, year of grieving, she chooses to have a book of Ovid in her hand in the painting. So she has talked to Ambleside uh, from time to time, and quite regularly she has brought up Ovid. And because she learned Latin and she was good at it and she needed to get a job, she went to work as a teacher of Latin and Greek in what was the second, we thought it was the first, but we found out it was the second, um, school of higher learning, college level school for women in the country, the Hartford Seminary for Women. And so she, we have her becoming the professor of Latin. So she talks, she gives uh, Ambleside a lot of Latin and Greek roots in an effort to teach him uh, about people and language and how we express ourselves. Great. Go ahead, another question. Yeah. The, the passage that you read uh, reflects uh, your great grandmother uh, was not particularly open-minded, uh, and it's also reflected with uh, other minorities. Is that accurate, or Very, is that? Uh, yes, um, it was accurate and passed down. I know it was accurate because it was passed down to my grandmother, who was, when I, I my first impression and my first understanding of racism 
which is not, uh, well, I was eight and I was visiting my grandmother in Santa Barbara. And she m made disparaging comments about those Catholics across town. I had never even occurred to me, and then she went on to denigrate uh, uh, Jews. And, and it, I grew up in, a, in this nice leafy suburb of New York City, and I, no one had ever expressed this kind of revulsion for uh, people of another religion. And so, yes, it was a basis, in fact. And we know that Henry Luke Hart, we, we, we are pretty sure, certain that Henry Luke, Henry, her, her husband, who, he not only enlisted uh, for the Civil War, in but the Union he, Army. The Union Army. On the, in, he was in the Illinois Regiment, in fact. But he was seriously wounded and s m mustered out. And a year later, he mustered himself back in because he was, and he fought to the end. Be, so he's very devoted to the Union cause. So we know that there was clearly a lot of tension in that house between these two individuals. We feel that um, we have... <laughs> It's a good thing that Edith passed on perhaps when she did, which was a little bit before I came on the scene. Uh, I am Jewish, and that would not have gone down well. And, 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 and I am not. <laughs> and he is not. <laughs> and uh, furthermore, um, the engagement ring that our son presented to his Chinese wife <laughs> came from Edith, and we thought that really would have killed her. <laughs> Times change, fortunately. Yes. We're going to read a little bit from one last chapter. And that is called... Laconia. Laconia. Laconia um, is, this is, takes place, we skip well ahead. This takes place in August of 1946. Two generations have passed. By this time, Ambleside and Mrs. Hermione Peel are on a first-name basis. That took a long time. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the characters here are members from the Hart family. Johnny is Henry and Emmeline's grandson, and Lottie, who you will hear, is their daughter, and Lottie is Johnny's mother. Laconia. Excuse uh, me, what page very is good. that? 171. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. Laconic is the word Hermione uses when describing Johnny these days. He has moved out, I'm sorry, he has moved in under our roof. Johnny had been in a medical unit during the three years he was engaged in Europe in this latest horrific world conflict. We were aware well over a year ago that the family expected him home and continued anxiously to expect him for months long before he arrived. Something detained him, but we knew not what. When he finally arrived, he moved in with us, saying he wanted to look after Emmeline, who is nearly a century old. Be that as it may, Hermione says to us, it is not clear who is looking after whom. She reports that Johnny says little, though he is very attentive to his grandmother, hence laconic. Years ago, Lottie and John Sr. converted the drawing room uh, into a bedroom for Emmeline as the steps were getting too chancy. From there, she can look out through our tall windows in three directions, onto our porch, over towards Sand Creek, or down the leafy lane with her lovely double row of tall poplars. Lena still comes faithfully five days a week, though her gait is getting slower and sh as she walks up the lane. Before Johnny came home, many nights when Emmeline was not feeling up to snuff, Lena would stay, sleeping on a cot in the parlor. Johnny has moved into his Aunt Edith's old bedroom, which is right above the drawing room. From there, he can hear his grandmother at night should she ring her little bell. Laconic, our teacher explained to us one evening, has its roots in the ancient Greek land of Laconia, 
Its inhabitants were famous for using few, as few words as necessary when speaking. They were people of action, warriors, who were trained from their youth to be sturdy and strong, expressing neither complaint nor enthusiasm. This is what put her in mind of Johnny after the war. She recounted to us the story of a 12-year-old Spartan boy. Sparta was the capital of Laconia. She said she heard this story from her sixth grade teacher and never forgot the gruesome image of it. The boy, like all Spartan boys, was in training to be a soldier. Among other deprivations, they were fed very little and were expected to forage for much of their food. The boy came upon a small fox and hid it under his tunic, thinking to make a meal of it later. Shortly thereafter, while he was standing in line at attention with the other boy soldiers, the fox started to attack the boy's belly, eating of his entrails. The boy spoke not a word of pain nor complaint, but ere long collapsed dead to the ground. We asked why she had recounted this terrible story. She explained that Johnny was used to be a very lively conversationalist. She used the word voluble to describe him in the company of his family and most particularly in the company of his grandmother. Now, however, there was no doubt that in, in, um, in her mind that he carries the heavy burdens from what he saw in the war. She feels great sadness on his behalf and wonders what he's hiding that is eating at him. And we're gonna skip to page 174, page 174. A little louder, Susie. Uh, okay, page 174. Ambleside, I have a long and dreadful account to pass on to you, and I must relate it while it is fresh in my mind. Or perhaps it would be more honest to say, I must relate it to you before, because that is the only way I can even try to empty my mind of it, though that is never likely to happen. Gird yourself. Uh, you will tell me that I am fabulating that what I am going to tell you is a tale from some demonic mythology, but it is not. Our friend's tone, as well as so many large and unknown words, alarmed us. She did not stop. Its unfolding began last night, when Johnny finally was all alone here. I count six days since Emmeline's quiet passing in the night, and two days since her burial. The girls have left, I'm sure you noted that, Johnny sat at table last night, at my table, alone, for a long time. A cigarette between his fingers and a glass of whiskey in his other hand, the bottle close by on my sideboard. Then I saw that Lottie had let herself in quietly and stood in the doorway to the kitchen. I'm not certain he even knew she was there until she went to the sideboard and brought out another glass. Taking the bottle and some ice from the ice bucket, she sat not opposite him, but catty corner at the table and poured herself some of the whiskey. She was silent for a very long time, as was he. I tell you, I never noticed until then how loud the pendulum clock in the parlor sounds. Johnny would look up at her from time to time, then down at his cigarette. Lottie sipped her drink, his went untouched. They sat, I don't know how long, until at last he said, What is it, Mom? Lottie replied, What is it, indeed? It is time you told me what it is. You need to tell me what you saw or what you did over there that has so devastated you. It will remain between you and me and Mrs. Spiel. We will neither of us repeat it to a soul. But you have to say now, Johnny, in sentences, and I need to hear every word. As if in answer to her command, the parlor clock struck eight times. Johnny finally took a drink and pronounced a long list of foreign names. Dachau, Buchenwald, Ravensbrück, Treblinka, Auschwitz. Do these names mean anything to you? he asked. Lottie stared at her son before replying, yes, some of them. 
We have read about some of them. They're the death camps. The Dachau trials are still being reported on in the papers. Yes, he said. I've been summoned twice to Fort Leavenworth to give depositions for those trials. You were there, she cried out, aghast. He took a sip and said, I was one of the first doctors to enter the gate at Dachau. I cannot quote all that he said, Hermi Hermione. Hermione warned us. Much will be beyond your ability to imagine, mine also. But what I am about to paraphrase for you pains me especially deeply. It pains me because I, as your teacher, have shielded you from the sordid aspects of human behavior, which have existed always, but on which I never chose to dwell myself. And here Hermione began to relate John's tale of going into a place called Dachau in the country of Germany, just as the war was ending. He spent months there, living in this place. It is what he experienced there, he told his mother, that had left him such a different person. Hermione's telling of all Johnny recounted was long and relentless. When Johnny finally stopped talking, when it was clear there was nothing more to say, Lottie asked him, why did you never tell us any of this at all, not a word? Well, he replied, I think we both know how your mother felt about the Jews, to say nothing of the Catholics and the Negroes and the homosexuals. I did not think she particularly wanted to know what I saw. It was easier that way. And Lottie said, I can't argue with that. I never did understand how Da lived with that. Then there was more silence. The parlor clock ticked and sounded another hour. Lottie finally said, Johnny, I don't know what to say. And Johnny said, Mom, what could you possibly say? And then he looked at me. What could Mrs. Spiel possibly, possibly say? Then Hermione said to us. Amble sighed. If ever I had wanted to wrap my arms around a living person in this house, it was that moment. Happy to take more questions if anyone else has another there thought. Some more questions, comments? Great. Thank you very much for coming, I have everybody. A question. Don't we? I have a question. Don't rush everybody out of here. Come on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> As uh, um, as a as a writer and a teacher of writing and literature, I was I wanted to ask you. I mean, I have lots of questions, but I know we have to have some limits. Um, in t we all have, whether we admit it or not, some sort of um, tender spot, someplace, usually. We usually, in our culture, put it by the heart. <laughs> other, other cultures put it in the bowels, but I don't want to go there. Uh, <laughs> but as you, as you think about um, the process of writing and the process of, of um, um, fumbling through, and I'm not saying you fumbled through, but I'm saying as a most of us as writers fumble through the English language. Uh, most of us as speakers of English fumble through the English language. But as you as you were putting the the book together, and then now it, you have the volume in front of you, um, can you look back, or maybe even more recently? Uh, during the process or during readings, um, is there a is there a, a phrase or a part of the book, or a few words, or maybe maybe even one word, in the book, that that really kind of that touches your heart still and and kind of you know catches your breath a little bit, 
Do, do you know what I mean? Is it? Okay. Is, I'll, I'll stop there then. Okay, just... I and if it's too personal... I mean, no, no, not yeah, too personal. You, you all a, are the judges it's a, of that. It's, okay. a, it's a, you know, Michael, that requires us to remember what we wrote. And there's... That's... We have to... We have to bring a few things to mind. I don't, does anything come to mind to yeah. answer that question? Go ahead. Yeah. The, uh, um, the funny thing about the book, so many people have, uh, they remark when they've read the book or they r leave a review on Amazon or we, they, they, they call us or they write to us and they tell us how, they tell us how um, overwhelmed they are at the end that the ending is very overwhelming to them. But we actually tell what the ending is on page one. <laughs> and so I think we find that by, we found that by the end of the book, and Warren, Warren did it, I mean, he, he wrote the end of the book and then it came to me. And it was, it was overwhelming that this thing that it's one of those, you know, you know it's coming, you know it's coming, you know it's coming, and then boom, it's here, and you forgot all the time that it was coming. And, um, and it's that for me, um, the idea that uh, I'm no longer in relationship with these two characters, I'm done. They're here, they're in the book, they're out of our heads, but they, but they aren't. That's the thing, and I think we both find that, for, for both of us, that um, unlike, uh, I can't think of another book, of course we haven't written a different book, I've written a lot of plays, I've written libretti, and I've had very close personal relationships with a lot of fictional characters. Uh, but I've never had a relationship to characters like I do with these two. Um, both as individual characters and as what they are to each other. what they become to each other um, is something that I, uh, I feel I, I will always have a relationship towards, with. Tell us a little bit more about the artist that painted uh, Mrs. Green. Well. <laughs> Just whatever you do, don't ask about timber framing because that's an eight hour lecture. <laughs> I, I will tell you that the, when the first batch of chapters, about five chapters came to me, and I, I had to go downstairs to Warren's office and say, my dearest dear, you can write a textbook or you can write a novel, but you can't do it both. <laughs> so all this has to go away. Uh, the, the question was uh, to tell a little bit about the painter who it painted the portrait. So. Um, I would, a subject I really love, uh, I quite like, because the portrait of Mrs. Peel is painted by a, an itinerant painter uh, who lived in New York and Connecticut, whose name is M.I. Phillips. Let's, let's be clear, the portrait is fictional, the painter is real. Good, good point, good point. Mrs. Peel herself is fictional, um, and, but, the painter is, I urge you to, uh, if you go and look up his work on the internet, you'll, it's astonishing. It's, oh, I, part of what is astonishing is this. He's been forgotten for a hundred years. And after his death in 1860, he, uh, a woman uh, scholar in 1976 uh, made enough research, including chemical research on paintings and brush stroke research and uh, associations of just visual and putting together that an, an artist known as the Limner of Kent was in fact a man named M.I. Phillips. Often when art historians and people who sell art 
don't know the identity of a painter, they will give that individual whose works they can identify, they'll give that individual a, an appellation of some kind. So the limner of Kent. So they turns out to be this man, M.I. Phillips, who in his time was not famous. He was not well known. He, this is at the time of John Singleton Copley. I mean, we're all, they're almost contemporaries. So everyone's um, in the art world has heard of Copley. Very few people had heard of his work, but his body of work is exquisite. And so now those paintings are worth upwards of a million dollars. And there are not that many. We have 34 uh, Vermeers in the world uh, that we know of, and there might be 70 uh, uh, M.I. Phillips paintings in the world. So it's not m many can based on most likely a, a much larger output. The Metropolitan Museum of Art recently acquired a, a beautiful example. There's a beautiful example at the National Gallery in Washington and in other museums around the country. Um, so that's M.I. Phillips, and we thought, it, 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 what's nice is that just to say, the part of this, oh, that gives away too much at the end. No, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> no, but anyway, thank you for that question, because I, I, have, I have enormous fondness for that particular painter. Oh, good. Thank you. That's great. 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 Thank you. Um, I, w I, w I want to say uh, just one couple of words about uh, how you make me cry, because <laughs> <laughs> this, book, this book makes me cry, but it also makes me laugh all the way through. It's just, it's so beautifully written. In June of this past year, not even a year ago, we received a manuscript in the mail from Warren and Susan, and we, um, uh, two of the two of us who read um, prose read it for Blue Cedar Press, and we both had the same response. We just absolutely love this book, probably more than any book we have published. We've done about 25 books, I think, so far. Um, and so within uh, less than six months, well, by October 15th, yeah. this book was in print. And it is, as you could see, as I could see tonight, when you read the last section mm. about Johnny and his mother and that conversation, and of course now with Ukraine, yeah. it is even, you know, it, it resonates even more with us and it brought tears. Yeah. Um, and the rest of that story of Johnny also is just very, very powerful. Um, Johnny's own mm -hmm. dealing with his, with his PTSD and his own who he is. Mm -hmm. um, so. I, I guess what I'm trying to trying to say and not saying very very effectively is that one of the wonderful things about this book is that you can savor it, you can read it multiple times, and you can read it read a chapter and just think about that chapter as I think you've seen tonight because you've only seen four little snippets right but it is but each of those four little snippets kind of comes alive and these characters um, I will never forget these characters they just they just will stay with me forever. Um, so I encourage you to um, get a copy of the book, get it signed by our wonderful writers. Um, they're going to be sitting back here in the, in, at the table. And if you are interested, um, get a, purchase a copy of the book, uh, get them to sign it. Give it, to, give it to friends. If you already have a copy, get a copy and give it to a friend. Um, yeah. they, this is, uh, and this if you have a copy, we'll certainly sign it. And if you have a copy you've already, you already received, they will be happy to sign it. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, we, we really uh, appreciate your coming out very, very much. And I would like to ask Warren and Susan first to go to the back and um, so that they can have a chance to get out back there and be able to shake your hand and talk with you if you're comfortable shaking hands. <laughs> They're wonderful people. <laughs> And we have a resident who, is, who was in Newton for many years before, grew up in Newton. So, can you watch this? Yes. <laughs>